Um, there is a, a problem, obviously, with some people going over to fight in various places, and that's been an ongoing problem. We had, uh, obviously, people like David Hicks going to Afghanistan. Um, we've had a number of people who have gone to other places, particularly Pakistan, Somalia, and so on. Um, the, the danger, I think, now is that, in particular, um, some of the groups are saying you could be more useful doing something back home, turning people around and, and sending them home, because obviously somebody with fair hair and blue eyes and so on is not going to be uh, viewed with such suspicion, um, not being of Middle Eastern appearance or whatever. Uh, so uh, um, that does become a, a, perhaps a concern for us. But as I say, we're much better now at tracking people and where they've been and that sort of thing. Although, you know, there's a lot of Australians travel overseas. I think there's a million Australians outside of Australia at any one time. So it's not an easy thing by any means. But um, particularly where people are dual nationals and they might go out on an Australian passport and then switch to another passport uh, once they leave the country. So we maybe lose track of where they're going. But um, up till now, I think we've been reasonably successful in keeping on top of that issue. But it certainly is a concern. Yeah, it, 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 it's a problem, I, I suppose, where people have sort of mixed views about things. I, I mentioned about the, the situation where it's a lot better to work with somebody before they actually do something, if you possibly can. If they become radicalised and other people in the community say, well, they're a bit concerned about this person or this group of people. It's much better to actually intercede and work with them uh, before they actually do something. So, I mean, that's obviously a, a focus. but. Um, Certainly it is a concern where you get people who are radicalised. In fact, I think Bin Laden uh, was not at all happy about some of the things that were going on, but his influence was declining. Um, you might remember that Abu Musa al sakawi in Iraq was the one who adopted the Chechen approach of cutting off heads and doing it on camera. And Bin Laden didn't like that at all. He said that they were to stop doing that because it was counterproductive from a you know, propaganda point of view. Um, I don't think Zakari took much notice. But, um, yeah, certainly I, I think Bin Laden wasn't happy with think, the way things went, but his influence, as I say, was in decline to some extent, particularly, I suppose, you know, as, as he went into hiding and disappeared and um, was less influential with his uh, propaganda. Um, well, Pakistan, uh, uh, the ISI, the Services Intelligence in Pakistan, has for a long time supported groups that operate into Afghanistan and into India. Um, the main reason being because they want to carve us or have a degree of influence in Afghanistan after everybody else leaves. And uh, in India, they want to keep pressure on India to hold the plebiscite over Kashmir. Um, but in Pakistan also faces huge problems from the Pakistan Taliban, which is very active against the Pakistan government. And there are some other groups like Lashkar Jangri and so on who also are active against the government. So it's, it's a, a difficult situation. And, and certainly I think Pakistan is a very important uh, country in terms of where things go in the future. Um, but I think uh, Australia could be more proactive, like for example, we could have offered to be honest brokers over Kashmir before now. Yeah. Um, we would be seen as perhaps being honest brokers to some extent. Uh, and if there was an agreement between Pakistan and India over maybe accepting the current line of control as being the border, rather than having a plebiscite, um, that would then mean that there would be less interest from a Pakistan point of view in supporting terrorism in India. So that would be a, a way of maybe diffusing part of the problem. I don't think you're going to dissuade Pakistan from trying to um, counter India in Afghanistan. Um, but of course, Afghanistan's got a way to run. And I think after 2014, it's going to be a lot of people making different accommodations with each other and so on. And, uh, you know, essentially, it'll be a bit like Oruzgan, where the, um, the governor and the police chief will be the lead people. Uh, after we pull out, and uh, both of them have got very bad records for, in the governor's case, corruption and drug running, and in the police chief's case, human rights abuses, killing people. So uh, we're not really handing over 
to anyone that's very savoury, and of course that's the case in much of Afghanistan. So it remains to be seen how much residual influence there is after the uh, drawdown. Uh, well, in fact, the, the, the most efficient killers of people are states, usually using organs of the state like the army or uh, like uh, or the militia, like in Syria, you know, where they're using the Shabir as the uh, to go in and kill people. Uh, they're much more efficient usually at killing people in large numbers than, of course, the Nazis were very good at killing people, gypsies and Jews and Slavs and so on. Um, but um, essentially, I mean, the, the, the definition of terrorism that I use, and there is no agreed international definition, is that it's politically motivated, uh, it's intended to shock and terrify, mainly directed against non combatants, and intended to have a strategic outcome. So it's not just random violence for the sake of it, it's got a, an aim in, in, you know, in the longer term to try and achieve. Isn't that Darfur? Well, to some extent it is, yes. And, uh, um, you know, could, you could categorize a lot of this as terrorism. See, the Taliban activities, the, what the Americans call the Kedoshura Taliban, which is the Afghan Taliban, as opposed to the Pakistan Taliban. Um, they do engage in terrorist acts, but they're basically an insurgency. And it, it, it's a gray area because very often you get insurgents who engage in terrorism because like the Tamil Tigers, um, if they don't engage in terrorism, the government will simply rely on the army to keep them at, at, at bay or contain them. And so what they do then is they do bombings in the capital city and that sort of thing. And if you go back to Malaya with the, the, the so-called terrorist, uh, uh, the CTs in Malaya, they were engaging in bombings and burning buses and killing planters and all that kind of stuff. So they were mainly an insurgency that had a terrorism dimension. Um, well, the Americans deny it, but um, the belief is that it's the, uh, the DO, which is part of CIA, that's been providing weapons. Uh, I think the Americans acknowledge providing funding and their main interest is in the Free Syrian Army and the Syrian National Council, which is pro-American. Um, but the problem when you send weapons into the country is they can just about go anywhere, and they sort of are spreading to different groups. And uh, you've got um, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a very extreme group, and then you've got Al-Qaeda people there that are also operating with them. Um, I don't know how many different elements there are in Syria. I, did look, I have looked at Syria. But there's probably about 10 different elements fighting within Syria. Very few of them have any interest in each other. Um, they're not prepared to see a ceasefire, which is a problem because at one stage the government said that they would go along with Kofi Annan's ceasefire proposal. Uh, but the rebels said, no, we're not, so we're not prepared to do that. Um, so that never went anywhere. It's not to say that the government are the good guys. There are no good guys that are in, in Syria. But, um, it's the problem I think is if the Sunni majority take over, there's the potential for the minority, which includes the Alawites who control things, to be massacred because of the 40 years of uh, control and to some extent the way that they've treated the, the Sunnis. So um, potentially it's, it's not going in a good direction. And I think arming the rebels is a counterproductive thing really to be doing because it's just going to create more problems for the future. Than the other Arab Spring countries that have had their troubles and supplies. Well, Saudi is uh, providing money. Uh, Qatar is also providing money. Turkey is providing arms. Most of the arms are going in through the north. Israel is supposedly also providing some arms as well. So there's no shortage of weapons in uh, Syria, <laughs> sadly. Um, but um, you know the, the problem is that the more weapons the the um, the rebels have got, the more they're able they are to take on the government, and less, less prospect there is of actually any kind of agreed outcome. So you could end up with a, I guess, a Libyan situation, but probably a lot worse. Maybe a combination of Libya and Iraq maybe might be the final outcome. Uh, I, I guess I think almost certainly. I, mean, I think that um, once we're sort of only got a few people left in Afghanistan, of course we don't have any really much in Iraq. Uh, I think that that'll take us off the sort of the radar as far as a lot of people are concerned. Um, but uh, 
Interesting what you were with the maritime side of things, of course, because one of the concerns at the moment is that um, uh, Al Shabaab, which is the group in Somalia, has been expressing some interest in going down the maritime terrorism route. Um, although they're not very competent and haven't done very much up till now, um, there has been some talk about getting lessons from the pirates who are more successful yeah, and uh, developing a capability that they could use down the east coast of Africa. Um, of course, the only major really attack that uh, was the that's caused casualties was the um, um, well, there was the coal attack, and then in 2004 there was the attack against the super ferry in Manila, which killed over 116 people. I think that's the most people killed in a maritime terrorism attack. But generally speaking, terrorists don't have haven't really sort of taken a lot of interest in maritime areas because it's too complicated. I think. they're much more hardline in China about that sort of thing and uh, people just disappear. Uh, there was a, an Al-Qaeda cell that went into China at one stage and they just disappeared. Never heard any more about them. Um, of course uh, also they have a very large number of executions in China as well um, and it, it's often hard to judge how much I guess um, opposition there is to the government unless there's a case where there's strict demonstrations because the local officials have, you know, been overly corrupt, um, then you don't often hear about it. Like if there's a, a, a man, for example, um, does a bombing, um, that will be usually put down to a marital problem or something like that. It's not, not because he's protesting about the, the system or the government. And um, they don't really hear a lot about what's going on in Tibet. But, um, People I've spoken to who have been in Tibet say, you know, that again, a lot of people disappeared in Tibet. So it's, um, I think, you know, China would say it's the, um, the good of the majority that's most important from a China point of view, stability and development of the economy and these other things that sort of are niggles which we can, you know, push to one side and deal with. So I think China has a different attitude to, to what Obviously, Western countries do. Yeah, uh, I guess that they are effective, but in this, uh, but not in the sense that uh, you know people can protest about their rights and that sort of thing very easily in China. You're seen as being a you know, disruption or counter revolutionary, or whatever, if you engage in that, that kind of activity. I, I think that um, inevitably we're going to see more Hazaras come. And I think we'll see more people come out of um, Oriskan as well because um, they'll use the fact that they work with us as a lever to uh, try and get out. I mean, we probably, knowing how the system works, we're probably already making lists of people who we would accept um, because they've been working with us as interpreters and so on, and they would obviously be number one for the chop if, uh, when the Taliban come back in and in force. So, yeah, I think that um, in terms of the negotiations, they've been going on for quite a long time. You know, they were, um, they excluded the Afghan government, which of course irritated Karzai immensely. Uh, and it also excluded the Saudis. And uh, it was just the Americans talking to the Taliban, Kedeshura Taliban. And uh, now I believe the Kedeshura Taliban got an office in Qatar. And they're talking to the Americans. They want some concessions from the Americans, um, like stopping targeting key Taliban people in Afghanistan, for example, and they're offering to reduce the level of activity by their people in the field, although it's not clear how much actual control they have over field operations, the people that are in Qatar, that is. So, but inevitably, I think that um, once there's a significant drawdown in the Western presence in Afghanistan, they'll refocus on the Shias, and uh, we'll see another flood of Shias coming out of uh, Afghanistan and going to Iran and Pakistan, and then they'll try and get to places like Australia. They have been effective, I suppose, in blunting to some extent the uh, operations of, uh, in particular, people uh, in North Waziristan into uh, Afghanistan, but as I say, I have some reservations when they are causing lots of collateral damage. 
if they can do it in a more refined way and they can actually demonstrate that the people they're taking out are actually a threat, um, then I would be more comfortable about it. But um, I'm not really in favour of extrajudicial killing or targeted killing. I think it's sort of a, not a good route to go down.